And good morning, everybody. I am your, I welcome to another episode of Big Blue Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Voltz, a sophomore here at SUNY Fredonia, here to talk sports. Well, a lot going on in sports this week and next week, so we'll get right to it. The women's soccer team was at home last night. They were playing Penn State Baron. It was a non-conference matchup and a close game against the good Penn State Baron team, too. The the Blue Devils end up falling 2-1. to one. Uh, but, you know, this is a Penn State Baron team. They came into the game at 9-4-1. and one. Penn State Baron is unbeaten in their conference, too. They don't play in the SUNYAC, but Penn State Baron and Fredonia have a common connection. You know, they play each other a lot in various different sports. Penn State Baron ended up taking the win. The Blue Devils actually scored first in this game. Grace Mackey scored late in the first half, but then two second-half goals for the Nittany Lions take it 2-1. to one. Blue Devils drop to 5-8-2 on the season and two five and one in conference play they got one more game coming up and i clicked away from that and i don't really entirely know why i did that um so they got one more game coming up in the regular season they are at home on saturday against suny new paltz this is their final regular season game of the season before the suniac tournament starts next week the first day of tournament play is next saturday october 28th the men's soccer team is at home tonight for their final home regular season game as they take on Penn State Baron at 6 o'clock. After that, they've got one more game left. They will be at New Paltz on Saturday at 1 p.m. before their SUNYAC tournament also starts on Saturday, October 28th. The men's soccer team in their most recent game fell at home to Oneonta. They had senior day on Saturday at 1 p.m. in a SUNYAC game, their final home conference game of the season ended up falling two to one in that game. Their losing streak extends to three. Overall record sitting at five, six, and four. Their conference record at one, six, and one. The men's and women's cross country teams recently finished up their regular season this past Saturday. They were at Geneseo for an invitational. The men's team finishing in 20th place out of 25 teams at the Mike Woods Invitational hosted by SUNY Geneseo. They are off this weekend, and then they will be in the SUNYAC Championships uh, next Saturday. And the women's team finishing 21st out of 23 teams last Saturday at Geneseo. They will also be competing at the SUNYAC Championships at uh, at Oneonta. So SUNY Oneonta is hosting the championships this year. The men's and women's swim and dive season has begun, but... They were off last weekend. They're back in action. Actually, their first home meets of the season. And I said meets because they're actually taking on two different opponents as the men's team is playing host to Hobart College on Saturday while the women's team plays host to William Smith College. The women's tennis regular season, of course, as I had mentioned last week on News at Noon, um, you may have anybody who listens to News at Noon frequently, you might have. You might have missed me on uh, on Monday. I was unfortunately feeling a little bit under the weather, but uh, we're back in commission now. As I was telling everybody yesterday, I was a little bit out of commission on Monday, but we're back at it now. So the women's tennis team was ultimately cut short. They were supposed to be finishing up the regular season at Penn State Baron last Wednesday, and that match was canceled due to some inclement weather. It was you know rain and all sorts of stuff and windy, and you can't really play tennis in that. Their last match, however, it, it's, you know, almost, you know, you never want matches to get canceled, but because that one was canceled, Fredonia was able to end their season on a win, and a, a pretty pretty big one, too. They ended up going on the road and beating SUNY Plattsburgh, which is their first conference win in more than two years. So, you know, that tennis team, their season has come to an end, and There was improvement there. Listen, I mean, yeah, the tennis team coming into this season, their most recent win was April 25th, 2021, because that was the 2020 season that was moved to the spring because of COVID. And this was a team that was, I mean, desperately searching for a win. They had gone something like 16 straight matches without a win. And then they end up beating Houghton back in September. And then to get the win over Plattsburgh, you know, that's something to build on. And, yeah, they're, they're saying goodbye to a few seniors. But they've also got a handful of freshmen that made some pretty important contributions. So I think that the tides are sort of starting to turn 
for this women's tennis team, and I think that they're turning for the better. The women's volleyball team is at home this weekend. It's their final homestand of the regular season. They are at home on Friday at 6 o'clock against SUNY Cortland, and then Saturday at 1 at home against Oswego, and that will be their last home game of the season. They've got a few more games left than most other teams do. Uh, they were actually in action. They were on the road twice last week, and I should mention at Brockport last Friday and at Geneseo on Saturday, falling 3 nothing in both of those games. So they've got a handful of games left. As I mentioned, they've got, you know, Friday the 27th, they're at Potsdam. Fr- uh, Saturday the 28th, they are at Plattsburgh. Then Wednesday, November 1st, they are at Hilbert College up in Hamburg in a non-conference matchup. Friday, November 3rd, they travel up to Henrietta. They travel up to RIT. And then on Saturday, November 4th at noon, they take on Carnegie Mellon. That game will be hosted at Geneseo. And then you get into the SUNYAC tournament, which doesn't start until Tuesday, November 7th. So the volleyball season goes on a little bit longer than a lot of other seasons do. And then finally, we get to the hockey season. So I actually had the opportunity to speak with head coach Jeff Meredith earlier this morning. And we talked about you know, the upcoming scrimmage. So for anybody who may not be aware, the men's hockey team is playing host to the All-Stars from the Eastern Hockey League this Friday night at 7 p.m. Now, the Eastern Hockey League is a, it's a junior league. It's a developmental league. Hockey is very different from a lot of other sports. So typically in other sports, you know, you think of in the context of like maybe football or basketball or soccer or whatever, you think of players who they finish high school and they go right to college, right? You know, they, they go into their freshman year of college. Hockey's a little bit different. Hockey, you know, you might play in high school or whatever. After graduation, players typically play maybe a couple years of junior hockey. So they'll play for like an amateur club somewhere. And then after a couple years of playing amateur hockey, then they'll play their college hockey. So college hockey players are a little bit older than most other college sports. Now, the EHL specifically is, obviously, it's an East Coast-based developmental league. And the special part about this is that a lot of numerous players on the Blue Devils roster previously played in the Eastern Hockey League before coming to Fredonia. You know, like, uh, just rattle them off, like Parker James did, Adam Hawkins did, you know, Ryan Bailey and Jake Murphy were teammates, you know, um, there's a handful of them. There, uh, Baxter Kimball did, and it's just going down the list right now. Johnny Melandruculo did. Uh, who else? Who else? Who else? Uh, Jake Blackwell did. Uh, David or no, David Subrink did not. David Subrink did not. Never mind. Uh, Spencer Quinn did. Like, you go down the list, and there's a Joe Santoro did as well. It, there's so many players. This is a. It's a really special thing for these players to be able to play against their former league. And as Coach Meredith told me this morning, he said, think of the opportunity that these young guys in the EHL have. You know, these are kids who are just freshly out of high school, pretty much, that are getting a chance to play against a college team in a college arena, and they're getting a feel for what college hockey is like on Friday night. It's a big tool for recruiting as well because, as as Coach Meredith said, this is a huge opportunity for them. And it's also, I think it's a huge opportunity for Fredonia. This is a chance to showcase what it's like. I would strongly encourage anybody and everybody to come out and watch this game on Friday night. And I wish, the one thing that I wish, I really wish there was not a home volleyball game at the same time. Because the volleyball team needs our support too. You know, like I feel bad, like, they had to be at the same time. <laughs> like, like, it couldn't be like the volleyball game was at 5 and the hockey game didn't start till 8 or whatever. So after the, you know, after the, the volleyball game, everybody could kind of funnel down to Steel Hall Ice Arena. But it, it's, it's unfortunate because you don't want to take fans away from the volleyball game. You know, hockey is, in, in my experience, hockey is... Probably, I would say, the most well-attended sport, student-wise, on Fredonia's campus. And it's unfortunate. And I don't want to 
I, I don't know if I should quite go into this whole thing too much, but I will say that student and fan support of Fredonia Athletics is badly lacking. I mean, I, I've been to a lot of games, and there's games where, I'm just going to be honest, there's games where there's nobody there. And that's that's sad. Like, this is like, we're supposed to be proud of our sports teams. We're supposed to be like, you know, going and support. Like, I've seen, so for context, I have been to a number of RIT men's hockey games. And obviously that's a little different because they're Division One, Fredoni's Division Three. But I'm telling you, those those RIT kids, you might think of RIT as, you know, it's just a bunch of like engineers or like people who are just like, oh, just a bunch of smart kids going to school. Well, let me tell you, those smart kids certainly know how to watch a hockey game because their student section is fun. They are awesome. They're called the corner crew. They go nuts. They get so creative with all their different cheers and things like that. And they're so loud and they're so fun. And I get it. Division one is different than D3. But I would love to see something like that happen at Fredonia. I would love to go to a hockey game, to go announce a hockey game, and just see that arena packed with people wearing blue and white. You know, I want to see the college kids in the front row pounded on the glass every time Fredonia scores a goal. You know, I want to hear more cheers from the student section. I just think there's a lot of things that can improve. The goal horn. I think I should bring that up. I think that Fredonia's goal horn is lame, personally. I'm sorry, I do. I think that it's not, like, you hear some other college goal horns and they're crazy. I'll get an air horn myself and go down there. I'll, I'll get, I'll get like, one of those, like, fog horns. Like, you know the old, like, crank ones? Like, like, like a, a work whistle or something like that? Like, the old, like, crank horns that, like, you just crank it up and it just, or, like, the storm siren. That's what I'm thinking of. Like, the Carolina Hurricanes have it, like a storm siren. That's what we need in Steel Hall Arena. I should bring that up. That's we need a really good goal horn because the goal horn we have, and let me tell you, student uh, attendance at hockey games is actually pretty solid. Like that's hockey's the one outlier that like actually is decently well attended. I would love to see it even more though. And I feel like when Fredonia scores, everybody's standing up, yeah, yeah, high five, and you know, cheering, pounding on the glass, and then the goal horn. The goal horn sounds about as wimpy as my car horn. <laughs> like, it's, oh, we got to pump that up. Like, like we really, we got to pump that up. I just, I want the Fredonia Athletics experience to be one of the best. No, no. I want the Fredonia Athletics experience to be the best in the conference. I want other schools, I want players from other schools to come into Fredonia and think, Oh, we got to go play those guys. I like, I want athletes from other schools thinking we got to go play at Fredonia. Man, I hate playing at Fredonia. That it's, that place is awful to play. Their fans are always so loud and everything. That's what I want. Like I want other SUNYAC schools, as crazy as it sounds, I want other SUNYAC schools to not want to come play here because the fans are so energetic and everything. That's what I've seen in other sports. Like, you think of Bill's Mafia, for example, obviously much bigger scale than Fredonia Sports, but you think of the Bill's fans and how loud and energetic and how unique of an atmosphere they create. That's what I want for Fredonia Sports. You know, I also come from a college town. For context, you know, I'm from a relatively, it's not necessarily a small town to me, but I understand in conversations with other people on campus that yeah, I come from a pretty small town. I mean, there's about 7,500 people that live there. That's that's like 3,000 less people than the size of Fredonia, you know, and, and I thought that my town was not that small, and I guess it is, but, you know, I come from a college town. I, I live very close to St. Bonaventure University, which is, you know, it's a small, private, Catholic Division One university, and... Let me tell you, their athletics are, some of them are not always the best attended. But if you've never seen the environment 
of a sold out St. Bonaventure men's basketball game, I highly recommend it. That is an insane environment. That is, I so I was at a game, geez, more than five years ago now, because my my grandparents have been longtime season ticket holders for both the men's and women's basketball teams. This was back in 2018. St. Bonaventure hosted, and I promise there's a point to this, St. Bonaventure hosted Rhode Island, who was a conference rival. Rhode Island had not lost a conference game yet. This was in, like, mid-February. Rhode Island, or late February, I think it was. Rhode Island had not lost a conference game yet. They were ranked number 16 in the country. Keep in mind, this is Division I. So Rhode Island was the 16th best team in the country. They were coming into St. Bonaventure, this small town, little, tiny, private university. And here comes Big Bad Rhode Island, ranked number 16 in the country. I will. I remember that night, they had said the week leading up to the game, they said it was going to be a whiteout. Everybody wear your white Bonnie's gear. I walked into that arena that night, and I know it's a small D1 arena. You know, there's only like maybe like 5,000, what are like 10,000, however many seats. I walk in through the concourse, going to our seats, and I look down at the student section. This place felt like the Roman Coliseum that night. I mean, it was loud in there the entire game. The student section was amped up on 10. And I will never forget, at the end of the game, the Bonnies were up by three. Rhode Island had the ball, and one of their better three-point shooters just kind of fired up like a fadeaway three at the buzzer, and he missed. Bonnies win. Huge upset over a ranked team. And here comes the student section. They all storm the court. I have, I have a video of it somewhere. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. All those students just rushed onto the court. And now... I get it. Storming the court, probably not a good idea. And I can't really come on the show and endorse that necessarily. It's like when the, uh, the Bills fans back in the 80s tore down the goalposts. But uh, by the way, little interesting tidbit. When the Bills tore down the goalposts against the Dolphins in 1980 after beating him for the first time in 10 years, my mom was actually at that game. She was 10 years old. She was at that game. Which, I don't know, I think is an interesting tidbit. I, every time I talk about tearing the goal po- tearing the goalposts down, my mom always remembers that she was at that game against the Dolphins in 80 when they finally beat him. But my point, my overarching point, because there was actually a point to this, believe it or not, my point was that the environment that places like that create is unmatched. And that's what I want to see at Fredonia. I want to see a sports fan environment that is unparalleled across the conference. Maybe even across Division Three, but that's a little bit of a lofty goal. Let's start with we got to create one of the – we got to create the toughest place to play in all the SUNYAC because I promise home field advantage, home ice, home court, whatever, that matters. I promise you it does. I've seen it from experience. You know, yes, it is true that there are a handful of Fredonia sports teams that – they're not one of the better teams in the conference. There's some that are like last in the conference, but you get a loud crowd atmosphere. Some of those teams might be able to steal some wins. And I don't know. I think that could be kind of special. So of course, again, the hockey game is Friday night at seven o'clock at steel hall ice arena against the Eastern hockey league all-stars. They're also in action on Saturday. They are at buff state for a 3 PM scrimmage. Their first home or their first regular season game. I should say is next Friday, October 27th in Angola, Indiana, as they take on trying university. And then their first regular season home game is Friday, November 10th at 7 PM against Buff State, and uh, I will be on the call for that one, as I will be for Friday. Parker Gannett and I will be on the call um, on the Fredonia Blue Devils website, which is fredoniabluedevils.com. And yeah, it should be a lot of fun, so definitely make sure to tune in. And thanks for tuning in for this episode of Big Blue Sports Podcast. I'm going to take a short break now that I've 
successfully rambled on for 20 minutes. I'm going to take a short break, and then when I come back, we're going to talk all about the uh, Major League Baseball playoffs and how those are currently shaping up. Later on in the show, I'll get to the Sabres win over the Tampa Bay Lightning last night and the Bills win over the New York Giants on Sunday night in my experience at the game. So thanks for tuning in to Big Blue Sports Podcast here on WCVF 88.9, the campus and community voice of Fredonia. Batman, what is this? Don't worry, Robin. You're listening to WCVF 88.9, the campus and community voice for heroes. And welcome back to Big Blue Sports Podcast. Before we keep going, I want to mention that the Career Development Office Graduate School Fair is happening. More than 60 institutions will be in attendance representing hundreds of graduate programs with Fredonia's own grad programs also featured. Related presentations will take place during the week of the event, including a grad school preparation program by the Career Development and the Office of Graduate Student Graduate Studies and workshops by the UB School of Medicine and the UB College of Arts and Sciences. The event will be hosted on Tuesday, October 24th from 4 to 6 p.m. in the Williams Center MPR. That's that big, giant, open middle room in case anybody didn't know because I didn't know until like two weeks ago. Anyways, the Major League Baseball playoffs are heating up. We are now in the championship series. And right now, neither series has been all that close. 
You've got the Battle of Texas in the ALCS, the Texas Rangers leading the Houston Astros two games to none, and the Philadelphia Phillies leading the Arizona Diamondbacks two games to none in the NLCS. The Phillies blew out the Diamondbacks the other night. I mean, holy cow. I mean, they they smoked them. So game one was on Sunday. We'll talk about the ALCS first. Game one was on Sunday. Um, and I got to open up. Actually, I'd love to see who the uh, slated starting pitchers are for those games. I'm not 100. There we go. So game one was in Houston. The uh, Rangers, I almost said the Astros won. They did not. The Rangers won that one 2 nothing. And then game two on Monday, the Rangers jumped out to an early lead. Astros came back. Nathan Eovaldi had a good start, but Houston ended up coming back, but it was not enough as Texas won it 5-4. to four. Game three is tonight at Globe Life Field, or was it, was it Globe Life Park anymore? I can't remember which one it is now. It's It used to be one of them, and now it's the other, and I can't honestly remember. Their old stadium was like 18 years old. I don't really know why they tore it down. But anyways, game three tonight at 8.03 p.m. Eastern time, that game on FS1, uh, which is Fox Sports 1. Christian Javier getting the start for the Astros, and it looks like it is going to be Max Scherzer going for the Rangers. It should be should be a good matchup. It's been a fun series to watch so far. Uh, game four will be Thursday, tomorrow in Texas, another 8.03 start time. Game five, if necessary, will be Friday at 5.07, also in Arlington, Texas. Game six, if necessary, will be on Sunday in Houston at 8.03. And then if it goes all the way to game seven, that will be next Monday night at 8.03 in Houston. That game, game seven, would be on Fox. All others would be on FS1. Now we'll turn to the National League Championship Series as the Philadelphia Phillies have more or less dominated the Arizona Diamondbacks in this series. Game one was on Monday in Philadelphia. The Phillies took that one 5-3. to three. Game two last night, the Phillies, man, alive. Bryce Harper's been amazing. Kyle Schwarber hit, I think, a couple of home runs last night. He let off the game first pitch with a home run last night. The Phillies blanked the Diamondbacks 10-0 in game two last night. Game They are off tonight as they travel. Game three is tomorrow night in Arizona, 5:07 on TBS. Game four, all of these games with this series will be on TBS. Game four in Arizona, Friday night at 8.07. Game five, if it's necessary, if the Diamondbacks win one. Game five will be Saturday at 8.07 in Arizona. Game six, if necessary, would be next Monday night at 5.07 in Philadelphia. And then game seven, if necessary, would be next Tuesday night at 8.07 in Philly. Again, all games on TBS. Your game three starters, uh, the uh, Phillies have actually not named their starter for game three yet, and it'll be Brandon. F- I can never remember how to pronounce this guy's last name. Is it Brandon Fott? I think I. it's it. his last name. Let me tell you how his last name is spelled. It's spelled P-F-A-A-D-T. You tell me how to pronounce that. I like, as somebody who gets their last name either mispronounced or misspelled all the time, I feel his pain, but like, you tell me how to pronounce that. I, I don't. I got nothing on that one. Sorry, Brandon. But the series earlier, of course, the Diamondbacks got to the World Series, or the World Series. The Diamondbacks got to the NLCS by sweeping the Los Angeles Dodgers in the NLDS. Game one at Dodger Stadium, the Diamondbacks crushed the Dodgers 11-2 as good old playoff Kershaw struck again. Game two on October 9th, the Diamondbacks won it 4-2. And then game three in Arizona, another 4-2 win for the Diamondbacks. Is this is a young this is what we talked about with I think this is what a lot of people expected to see out of the Orioles was a young team finding success in the playoffs, but the Diamondbacks have made it there. And then the uh the Phillies in a great series beat the Atlanta Braves in four games. Game one in Atlanta, Phillies won three nothing. Game two, the Braves tied it up with a 5-4 win. Game three, the Phillies just dominated 10-2. They've got a prolific offense in Philadelphia. And then game four, the Phillies won it 3-1 to to take the series. Other uh, ALDS, Houston beat Minnesota in four. The Astros took game one, 6-4. Minnesota evened it up with a 6-2 win in game two. 
Houston dominated Game 3, 9-1, to and then Game 4, the Astros took it with a 3-2 win. And then Texas, they were wild coaching. Texas swept the top seed Orioles. 3-2 win in Game 1, a high-scoring affair, an 11-8 win for Texas in Game 2, and then Game 3 in Arlington, the Rangers dominated and won 7-1. to I had mentioned that if, if it is a Phillies versus Rangers World Series, is this not what everyone thought we were going to get back in 2011 before my favorite team, the Cardinals, came in and just wrecked all of it? <laughs> it's, it's funny because as a Cardinals fan, it's like, okay, I'm not a big fan of the Phillies, to be honest with you. Sorry, Phillies. Diamondbacks, yeah, I am kind of indifferent about the Diamondbacks. I can't stand Houston. <laughs> And then for, uh, wow, I just totally blanked the Rangers. Jeez. And then for the Rangers, it's like, well, kind of feel bad because the Cardinals more or less stole Texas's World Series in 2011. I mean, the Rangers were one strike away, and then uh, David Freese happened. But, uh, you know, we'll take it. So I think a lot of St. Louis fans are honestly like, all right, Rangers, you guys can have this one. <laughs> I, I think St. Louis fans are saying as long as it's not Philadelphia or Houston, you know, we'll take it. We wouldn't mind if it was Arizona, but I think a lot of Cardinals fans are saying, you know what, Texas, you can have this one <laughs> since we uh, kind of took yours 12 years ago. Oops, sorry about that. But anyways, I'll take a short break, and then I'll come back and talk about the Sabres' thrilling victory over the Tampa Bay Lightning and then finish talking about the Bills' victory on Sunday night over the New York Giants. Thanks for tuning in to Big Blue Sports Podcast here on WCVF 88.9, the campus and community voice of Fredonia. Tune in to High Noon Friday, where there's a little something for everyone. 
news, sports, fun games like trivia, and student-produced weekly segments. Every Friday at noon, right here on 88.9 WCVF The Voice and 89.5 WDVL The Inferno. We are Fredonia Radio Systems. And welcome back to Big Blue Sports Podcast. Before talking about the Sabres on this day in Buffalo sports history, October 18th, 2003, 20 years ago, I just made every single millennial in the room feel really, really old. The Sabres beat the Calgary Flames 2-0 in Calgary at the, then it was called the Pengrove Saddle Dome. Now it's the Scotiabank Saddle Dome, and it's the soon-to-be-replaced Saddle Dome. The Sabres beat the Flames 2-0, Alesh Kotalik, and Miroslav Shatan scored goals for the Sabres in that game. Shatan's was on the power play. Uh, Coda League's goal was assisted by Chris Rory. Shatan's was, Shatan's was assisted by Rory Fitzpatrick. There's a name in Sabres lore. As the Sabres won 2-0, Mika Norinen had a 20-save shutout. I just brought back some names that some Sabres fans either didn't remember or didn't want to remember. But I mentioned the Sabres, of course, because last night was a big game. They won their first game of the season last night at home against the Tampa Bay Lightning. In a game that, attendance-wise, not great. You know, they only had about, the official figure was 12,598. That's only a 66% capacity. But you also have to keep in mind that it's a Tuesday night game in October. You figure for families, it's very expensive to take a bunch of families, especially if they're paying $50 a ticket to go to a game. That's that's a lot to ask. You know, I, I brought up the example last year when people were complaining and whining and crying about attendance. I brought up the point last year. I grew up in a family of five. You know how expensive it is to take a family of five to a sporting event? Hint, very. It's very expensive. But to the game itself, the Sabres got on the board about midway through the first period. Zemgus Gergensen scoring his first of the year, assisted by Tyson Jost and Matias Samuelson. And then Jeff Skinner, as breaking free, played throughout the arena. Jeff Skinner scored with a few minutes left in the first period on a gorgeous pass from Owen Power that found Skinner right at the side of the net. Skinner buries his first of the year power, and Tuck get the assist. 2-0 Buffalo after one. Sabres more or less dominated the second period as well. They played very well last night. And then an unlucky bounce with two minutes and two seconds left in the second period as former Sabre Brandon Hagel scores his third goal of the year. Anthony Sorelli and Tanner Juneau get the assist. Tampa is on the board 2-1 Buffalo after two. In the third, again, Buffalo, you know, they, they had a, a one-goal lead. Matias Samuelson got hurt, so they were playing with five defensemen. And Buffalo kind of took their foot off the gas, not in terms of effort, but, you know, they weren't really taking as many chances as they, as they were early in the game. They were still working hard, but, like, you know, they, they weren't really trying for as much offense is what I mean to say there. And they had played well in the third-ish, but unfortunately just a little bit too much pressure. And then a, you know, a miscue or two on the boards. The puck comes right out in front of the net with just a few seconds left. And old friend Brandon Hagel buries his second of the game with just seven seconds left. Hagel's fourth of the year. Brandon po- Braden Point gets the assist. It's 2-2 going to overtime. In overtime, I don't even think the Lightning got a shot. Buffalo absolutely dominated pace of play before Dylan Cousins rips a wrist shot that goes off the post and in. You could hear that puck hitting the iron on Chippewa Street. It was so loud. Dylan Cousins buries his first goal of the year. It's an overtime winner. The Sabres win it 3-2. to two. Jordan Greenway and Rasmus Dahlin get the assists. Buffalo gets the win. They improve to 1-2 and two on the season. Tampa Bay drops to 1-2-1. One, and one. The Sabres outshot the Lightning 31-23 in the game. Faceoffs were mostly even with a slight edge to the Sabres. That's something that I've noticed has greatly improved for Buffalo this year. They're, they have been way better from the faceoff dot so far this year. Even in the games they lost, they've been significantly better from the faceoff dot this year, at least from my observation than they have been the last couple of years. Defensively, they've really improved as well. There's some players who have been just absolutely lighting it up, not necessarily on the score sheet, but guys who have been overall developing a much more well-rounded game. 
Jordan Greenway seems to be yet another successful Don Granado reclamation project. You know, last year when the Sabres got Greenway, they traded a second round pick and a fifth to Minnesota to get him at the trade deadline. And a lot of fans were disappointed in how he played, you know, after the Sabres got him. So far in the first three games of this season, he has been excellent. He's been really good for them. And you look at the growing list of guys that before Granado coached them, they were in trouble. Not going to lie. They were not playing very well. And now look at them. I mean, you can just rattle them off. Tage Thompson is obviously the big one, but it goes so far beyond him. Jeff Skinner, Rasmus Dahlin, Casey Middlestat is certainly one. Dylan Cousins, I would argue, could also be one. Alex Tuck could be one. You know, Henry Yoki Haru might be one. He's been solid so far this season. He hasn't been bad this year. Except, I mean, he had a, a bad game for the Rangers, not against the Rangers, not going to lie. But from what I understand, because I missed the uh, game Saturday night against the Islanders, but from what I understand, he was solid in that game. He looked decent last night, too. I didn't have any issues with how he played. You know, so I, I'm willing to trust Don Granado. When the Sabres want to take a chance on a guy, I'm willing to trust Granado. Because in my opinion, he has proved that he can get the best out of players. He's got experience coaching Jordan Greenway. And so far, yeah, that's been evident. Greenway has been a much different player this year. I mean, he struggled when he was in Minnesota last year. That's one of the reasons why the Wild traded him. And it didn't get a whole lot better when he got to Buffalo last year. So far this season, excellent, excellent. You know, the top six, yeah, they haven't really maybe gotten as much offense from they want than they want from their top six so far this season, but I would say the defense has improved. Um, you know, you've got some guys that got on the score sheet for the first time this year, like Skinner and Cousins. That third line, let me I gotta give a shout out. That line of Jordan Greenway, Casey Middlestat, and Zach Benson, those three have been excellent. So far this season, terrific. And last night, so the Sabres made a lineup change last night as well going into the game. Victor Olofsson was a healthy scratch, and Tyson Jost was in the in the lineup for the first time. Jost was on the fourth line, centering Gergensen's and Akposo. They moved Peyton Krebs up from the fourth line to the third, so Krebs was in between Jordan Greenway and Zach Benson on the third line. And then they put Middlestat on the wing on the Paterka and Cousins line. Yeah, that worked. <laughs> I'd say that worked. You know, and and I Olafson, I don't mean it I don't mean to just drag Victor Olafson's name through the mud, but the problem with him is that he's kind of a one-trick pony. He's got an excellent shot. Certainly does. He can put pucks in the back of the net. But there's certain aspects of his game that sort of lack. He's not great defensively. He's not one of their better skaters. He's not an excellent passer, you know. So I think that having Jost in the lineup, because Jost is a good defensive forward. I mean, that fourth line of Gergensen's Jost and Ekposo, we could tell last year that they worked. Yeah, they still work this year. I think they roll with it. Peyton Krebs, I thought, had an excellent game last night too. He's a young guy who's looking for an opportunity. This is going to be a crowded young forward group for the Sabres. There's, guy, there's opportunities to be had and some of these guys are going to be hungry for them. So I honestly think that Peyton Krebs, he keeps playing the way he's playing right now. He's got a chance to be an everyday lineup player. He's been really, he was really good last night. I was overall, I was thoroughly impressed with the way the Sabres played as a whole. Yeah, they kind of took their foot off the gas in the third a little bit. But other than that, you know, both of Tampa's goals, both of Hagel's goals were honestly off of bad bounces. Like, Levi was awesome last night. Devin Levi, this young man is the real deal. And I know I, I, I can't really call him, you know, you hear a lot of sports people be like, oh, this kid. I can't really call somebody who's older than me a kid, which is what kind of makes me excited because I can call Zach Benson this kid because I am older than Zach Benson which is both good and bad, realizing that I'm now older than a player on my favorite hockey team. And I don't know how I really feel about that. I can just kind of hear my joints starting to go as I even say that sentence. But anyways, I was thoroughly impressed 
very pleased with the way the Sabres played last night. They are actually starting a homestand. They are in action again tomorrow night against the Calgary Flames. I will be at that game. I can't wait to share my experience with all of you next week on the show. Uh, We're going to take a quick break, and then I'm going to finish out the show talking about the Bills' Sunday night win over the Giants, previewing their game against the Patriots, and, of course, making my picks for this upcoming week of NFL action. Thanks for tuning in to Big Blue Sports Podcast here on WCVF 88.9, the campus and community voice of Fredonia. Pencil, oh, the boys are slang. The best you ever had, the best you ever had is just a memory and those dreams. But as daft as they seem, as daft as they seem. Listening to 88.9 WCVF, the voice of Fredonia's local music. And welcome back to Big Blue Sports Podcast. So the Bills game on Sunday night. Mm, that was oh boy. Okay, so it, uh, let me start. Let me just start off by saying they won. Okay, it was a win. A win is a win. And believe me, I have been trying to put that in my head. All week so far. A win is a win. We'll take it. <laughs> Other than that, it was, uh, ooh, rough. I mean, that was not a particularly good game. So I was at the game, actually. I was there. Uh, my cousin had texted me last week, and he had said, hey, what are you doing on October 15th? And I was like, I don't know, probably watching the Bills game somewhere. I don't know why. What's up? And he had told me that he'd won tickets in a raffle, actually, and asked me if I wanted to go to the game. I was like, of course I want to go to the game. Like, absolutely. So I've been to every home game this year, which is like, I don't, I don't even, like, know why or how. I, that, I don't know. But so the game started slow. It was slow. The whole thing pretty much was slow until we got to the fourth quarter. The Bills were wearing their all red. You know, a thrill. it was a Sunday night game. It was going to be the... The Brian Dayball revenge game, the Tyrod Taylor revenge game, 
because Daniel Jones was out and injured. Saquon Barkley did play. The Giants actually got on the board first after a 12-play, 45-yard drive. Graham Gano hits a 29-yard field goal. Giants up 3-0 at the end of the first quarter, and everybody's thinking, yo, what's going on? What's wrong with the Bills? And second quarter was more of the same. Graham Gano hits a 43-yard field goal with about five minutes left in the half. 6-0 Giants. And everybody's wondering, what is going on with the Bills' offense? I mean, they, they weren't doing anything. Josh Allen didn't have time to throw, and he wasn't really being smart with his pocket anyways. The only guy who could get open was Stephon Diggs. And the run game? What run game? Do we have a run game? It didn't really show up Sunday night. be completely honest with you. End of the first half, Giants had the ball, and Tyrod Taylor audibles to a run play with like 10 seconds left. Giants had no timeouts, mind you. Saquon Barkley gets stopped at the goal line. And Brian Dayball was furious with Tyrod Taylor. Understandable why. Because you have no timeouts and you're calling a run play. That's, man, that's not, that's not very smart. I will say that. Um, so third quarter, nobody scores. And at this point, every time Buffalo gets off the field offensively, the boos are kind of starting to come down. Because this is supposed to be one of the most prolific and dynamic offenses in the league. And you're getting shut out by the Giants. Yeah, I mean, sad. Ridiculous. Really, really poor effort from the offense. I was, inc- I was honestly, to be completely honest, I was disgusted with the way the offense played in the first three quarters. I thought they showed a pathetic effort. Listen, the Giants defense played a very good game. I don't want to take it away from them. But I was disgusted with the incredibly poor effort from the offense. Terrible. I mean, like you're playing one of the worst teams in the NFL, and you're getting shut out through three quarters of play. That's embarrassing. At home, in a primetime game, that's embarrassing. And there was no weather excuse. Wasn't raining. Wasn't snowing. Wasn't windy. So what's your, what's your excuse now is pretty much the thing. And I know you can say, Oh, man, you know, we just, we got to execute better. We got to play better. Okay. You said the same thing last week, and it didn't happen. So what now? Where's the offense we saw against the Miami Dolphins or Washington or the Raiders? This This is opening night Jets offense. I mean, not good. Not good. But they start the fourth quarter. They have the ball in the red zone, and Josh Allen hits Deontay Hardy for a three-yard touchdown. It was kind of a swing pass. Hardy was just wide open on the left side. Giants gave him way too much room. Hardy scores his first touchdown as a bill after a 17-play, 89-yard drive. The offense finally woke up in the fourth quarter. The Giants come down the field. Graham Gano hits a 29-yard field goal to give the Giants the lead with 10 and a half minutes left. Bills drive down the field, 12 plays, 75 yards, capped off by a 15-yard touchdown pass from Josh Allen to Quentin Morris. That was an outstanding play from Allen. I mean, that, that touchdown was... That was an insane throw from Josh. I mean, he was scrambling around, fitted into a very tight window. The throw had to be absolutely perfect, and it was. I mean, that's vintage Josh Allen right there. That was a remarkable throw from him. Bills go up 14-9. to Giants drive down the field, and what we think is the last play, Tyrod throws a pass into the end zone. Pass is incomplete. Everyone celebrates, but there's laundry on the field. They called Terrell Bernard for a questionable pass interference. A lot of times they let that go at the end of the game. They called Bernard for it. So the Giants get an untimed down from the one-yard line, and Tyrod throws a pass into the end zone intended for Darren Waller that falls incomplete, and we've got controversy again. No flag is called. Bills win 14-9. to Now, the Giants wanted a penalty for pass interference or defensive holding as Taron Johnson was holding on pretty tight to Darren Waller's jersey. I won't deny that. What I will say, though, is that Darren Waller also was pretty much, you know, like Darren Waller also had his hand on Taron Johnson's face. So my argument is if they would have called pass interference or holding on Taron Johnson, then they would have also had to call, you know, illegal hands to the face or illegal contact on Darren Waller as well. So 
I think it's a fine no call because it, there were penalties because fouls were committed by both players. So here's the thing. If you call it both ways, nothing happens. So, yes, they could have said the fouls offset and the Giants get a reset down, but, you know, it's it's nothing. So Bills end up winning. They improve to 4-2. and two. They're 3-1 and one at home. Giants drop to 1-5, 1-3 and, five, one and three on the road. The Bills are in New England against the Patriots on Sunday. That's a very winnable game for Buffalo. New England has a solid defense that has played horribly as of late. But as I said earlier in the season, you've got to put the Patriots away when you have the chance because New England is, that is a football team that they have hung around some games this year. You know, they almost beat the Eagles earlier in the year. They almost beat Miami on Sunday Night Football earlier in the year. So, This is a Patriots team that you get an opportunity to put them away. You got to do it. You know, and I actually did just see before I get to my picks, I do want to say that it is just in that NFL commissioner Roger Goodell has agreed to a contract extension through March of 2027. The league announced Wednesday to the chagrin of the NFL fan base. I am sure, but he keeps the owners rich, so they'll take it. You know, I I don't know, whatever, whatever. It's fine. So my picks from last week, I did okay. Um, I got a handful of them right. Um, you know, I did fine. I It was all right. I did okay. But let's get to our picks for this week. So, tomorrow night's game at 8.15, the Jacksonville Jaguars heading into New Orleans to take on the Saints. Jacksonville at 4-2, and two, New Orleans 3-3. Three and three. 79% of voters going with Jacksonville to win it. And I will agree. I think that, you know, I just think the Jags are honestly a much better team. I think that's a good football team. And I think they win to go to 5-2. and two. That game on Amazon Prime Video tomorrow night at 8.15. Now we get into the Sunday 1 p.m.s, the 3-3 three and three Las Vegas Raiders heading into Chicago to take on the 1-5 Bears. 81% of voters going with the Raiders. Uh, and I'll agree. I think if Justin Fields, you know, I with Justin Fields hurt, you know, he played well on Thursday night against Washington a couple weeks ago, you know, The Raiders, I think, are a better team. They're not a great team, but they're a better team, and I think the Raiders come away with a win in that one. The 3-2 Cleveland Browns head to Indianapolis to take on the 3-3 Indianapolis Colts. 82% of voters going with the Browns, and why shouldn't they? They had a big win over the 49ers on Sunday. The Colts are not a team to be taken lightly. However, I think because the Browns' defense is so lethal, I'll go with Cleveland to win that game, but that could be close. Do not count out the Colts this year. That's a football team that is going to make some noise. The Buffalo Bills, of course, at 4-2, and two, heading into New England to take on the wild come back to the Bills game. The Washington Commanders heading into New York, or should I say New Jersey, to take on the New York Giants. Uh, the, wa- wa- the Commanders at 3-3, three and three, Giants 1-5. and five. 70, 76% of voters going with Washington, uh, and I'll agree with that. I think Washington is a much better team than the Giants. I think the Giants are honestly in some trouble right now. Uh, another 1 o'clock game in NFC South battle. The 3-3 three and three Atlanta Falcons heading down to Tampa to take on the 3-2 and two Bucks. 79% of voters going with the Bucks. I'm going to be unoriginal again. I agree. I'll take Tampa. 1 o'clock on Fox. This is going to be a good game. The 5-1 and one Detroit Lions heading into Baltimore to take on the 4-2 and two Ravens. 66% of voters going with the Lions. 34% with the Ravens. I'm going to go with the Lions. I think Detroit is on a roll this year. Dan Campbell has those guys playing lights out football. I think they're going to take that win. In the 405 window, two 405 games, the 3 and 2 Pittsburgh Steelers heading to Los Angeles to take on the 3 and 3 Rams. 77% of voters going with the Rams. And yeah, I'll agree. I think I'll take the Rams in that one. The Steelers offense is just not good enough to compete to be completely honest. The Arizona Cardinals at 1 and 5 heading into Seattle to take on the 3 and 2 Seahawks. 96% of voters going with Seattle. I will agree. I think Arizona is a team that's kind of in shambles right now. And the 425, we got two 425 games. The 2 and 3 Green Bay Packers heading to Denver to take on the 1 and 5 Broncos. 81% of voters going with the Packers. I will agree. I think Green Bay takes the win in that one. 425, the 2 and 3 Los Angeles Chargers heading to Kansas City to take on the 5 and 1 Chiefs. 90% of voters going with the Chiefs. I will also pick the Chiefs, but I will say I think the Chargers keep this game close. The Chiefs have been in a lot of close games this year. The Chargers usually hang around with Kansas City. I'm going to go with the Chargers to win that game, or I'm going to go with the Chiefs to win that game. 
Sunday night football. Ooh, this is going to be a good game. The 5-1 and one Miami Dolphins heading into Philadelphia to take on the 5-1 and one Eagles. Man, that's going to be an excellent game. 52% of voters going with the Eagles, or going with the Dolphins, rather, 48% of the Eagles. And it is not out of a bias standpoint. I'm going to pick the Eagles to win this game, to be honest with you. And the reason why is that I think Philadelphia has a better defense. I think it's the same case as Buffalo. Miami's got a great offense, but I think Philadelphia has a better defense than Miami, and that makes the difference in the game. That game Sunday night on NBC. And then the Monday night game, the 5-1 and one San Francisco 49ers heading into Minnesota to take on the 2-4 and four Vikings. 49ers reeling after their first loss of the year. That's my other point about the Eagles. They're going to come out hungry, too. I think the 49ers win. And then finally, to cap off the show, I think the Bills go into New England and beat the New England Patriots to improve to 5-2 and two on the season. So that'll do it for another episode of Big Blue Sports Podcast. I will... Catch you next week to hopefully recap a Bills win over the Patriots. And, of course, I'll be here to talk Sabres and Fredoni Sports as always. So thanks for tuning in here to Big Blue Sports Podcast. I'll catch you next week. Be well, everyone.